fits right here. So let me know yeah, if it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. But we were talking a little bit about um, tuning or hyperparameters and uh, grid searches. And I was wondering if our hyperparameter space gets so big, right? There are alternative methods like um, random searches, right? Where mm -hmm. we we pick new hyperparameters, try them out, and if they don't work, we switch one out and kind of kind of browse the model space, um, not completely, but more selective. Are we gonna talk about this, cover this, or what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, we will. Uh, cool. I think I estimate that to be class five, where I talk about this platform that uh, is called weights and biases, right? Mm -hmm. So within weights and bias, if you set up what's the method that you want to refine to do like a hyperparameter search over, right? You can define what's the range of the hyperparameter search that you want to explore, right? And then you can also define what's the method that we want to use. So you can use like uh, random permutations of the hyperparameters. You can use grid search or use something more elegant, like a bias search, a uh, Bayesian yep. search, right? So like, that's something that we're going to include. Given cool. the, the time, I might merge that lecture with the convolutional neuronal network section. So we're going to see both together. So like, we're going to implement CNN and use weights and biases to do the hyperparameter search at the same time. Cool. But that's what I'm going for at this point. Excellent. I will save all my questions for that session then. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Yeah, thank you. And uh, <laughs> one small question: or, 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 what do you think about the boosted regression trees, a BRT method, and would you you cover it maybe shortly? It is it could be rather powerful in some cases. Uh, boost regression tree probably does something closer to what Pepe does, right? Like Pepe uses random forest more often than I. Yes, is a, a is a variation of random forest. There is the XJ mm -hmm. boost and also boost tree regression. They are they are in the same branch of classification tree uh, regression classification tree algorithms. Um, so the XJ boosting is getting more popular in the last three, four years. I see some several applications. They've been tuning better the, the kernel density inside to the random random searching. So something particular in that context. Um, so we are not going to cover it in the in details. And again, is in the same concept of random forest. So they don't need a, a lot of tuning parameters. So as you knew, you learn, yeah, soon you apply to the data, they are going to fit quite well without so much tuning. Uh, but anyway, testing. If you want to also bring in something that we are not covering for your final work, feel free to do it. You don't have to stick uh, to whatever we cover. Eh? And of course, we are open to also to, to learn from our side. So feel free oh, to yeah. use XJ boosting. Yeah. It's probably already, uh, I didn't never use it inside to the, but it's probably inside to the same ski learn library that Antonio is using. Yeah, no, in, in fact, like last year for final projects, uh, we had several people that were actually using unsupervised learning, which is a thing that we okay. don't even propose yeah. like for the course. But like depending on your problem, we're going to suggest what's the most appropriate method to approach it, like regardless if we have covered in the course so far or not. So feel free to reach out to us and we can always try to propose something that better fits your needs. Yeah. Yeah, Any other questions before we start? If not, maybe we start with this. So uh, one, yeah. One one second. Let me let me show to mm -hmm. everybody the file that you are going to get. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, if you do the typical git pool inside to the SE data, while well, I do that, I'll be back in a second. I'm going to get my water yeah. for the IT. Perfect. So if you do the git pull um, on the SE data, always, Alex, remember to enter in SE data and do the git pull. And then you will see all these new files that are appearing, OK? Um, <clears throat> plus the one in the lecture uh, that should be, that is the, OK, maybe it's not listed, but should be under lecture, the one that they just put. Okay. And it didn't, it didn't get, anyway, to start to do it. Let me do it again. Git pull as a reference. Lecture. So this one. OK, 
けど、その闇というのを巡る。Okay, now, now probably it's, it's going to work. It's okay, now I have it. Okay, and then the typical R sync to get everything in the new location. And then, as usual, you can go inside to R SE data and then inside exercise. Okay, and here you will have the new. The new file, this tree, that we are going to use it with Antonio. Okay. Is it clear for everybody? Okay. I think it should be clear for everybody now.、Um, okay. Give the The floor to Antonio. Okay. Can you guys see this screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. And this one yeah, is so, under the lecture. Yeah.、Mm -hmm. Yeah. You guys should have the PDF already for this lecture. So, what's the agenda for today? As usual, we're going to do a quick recap, right? So, like, we're going to remember some of the concepts that we discussed during the linear regression and the loss minimization regularization、uh, sections of the previous lecture. We are finally going to get into the perceptions. So, like, we're finally going to start discussing what's this, this small building block that composes these large neuronal networks that we have seen out there in the wild nowadays. Some of the architecture, we're going to discuss how to train those methods. We already have discussed a little bit about the idea of like the、uh, computation of the gradient so we can optimize the weights. And we are going to get even further on that. And then finally, we are going to move from like discussing this single uh, uh, per uh, perception, the single neuron, right? And we're going to understand exactly what's the connection between Uh, the formalization, the formulation of the perception, and why we call that a neuron, right? And how we can use that to scale up to more complex problems by stacking those building blocks and form this feed for neuronal networks. Okay. And then we're going to discuss some of like the delicate tricks that you, you need to keep in mind when you're training such mod models. Okay. Very well. So the first thing that let me close the windows here. Okay. So I can see the full slide. Okay, so yeah, we discussed a little bit about the linear regression, right? So, like, if you guys recall, usually I have a data that looks like this, right? Which has like x as being like the features or predictors, right? As being the columns of this table, the rows that correspond to the samples, okay? And then I have、uh, the labels that are associated to each one of the samples, right? So, for example, if you're talking about the tree height data set. Those were like the x and y position,、uh, the other factors like the child's feature, like elevation and so on, right? And y would be what's the、uh, the true height of the trees, or at least the height that was estimated using the six algorithms that we discussed in the previous lecture, right? When we are training these methods, one thing that we do is to fit the data to like a portion of、uh, fit the method to a portion of the data, which we call the train. Uh, set right, and then we evaluate the performance of the method on a separate or head out uh, uh, section of the data set, which we call the test data set. Okay, then as we had discussed,、uh, it has the task has to be a couple uh, uh, followed by like defining what's the correct metric, like for making the inference if this method is performing well or not. Right, in the case of regression, we have discussed that the mean square error is the way to go. Which essentially、uh, tells us what's the difference between、uh, the、uh, ground truth measure, like what's the、uh, actual height of the tree, for example, and what was the estimate of my method, right? So here, y test is the true value, and this is the estimate of my method. Okay, and when I'm computing this, essentially what I'm doing is trying to find what's the optimal set of weights. 
that are going to take me closer and closer to getting an output of the method uh, of my model, right? That better approximates the true value of this uh, data that I'm trying to regress. Again, in this case, the height of the trees, okay? Then we discussed how we do the fine tuning of these weights, right? Which essentially stands for finding what is the optimal set of weights, right? That's going to get me to the point where I minimize the loss, right? Or in this case, I minimize the difference between what's the output of my model and what's the ground truth value, okay? And we do that by computing the derivative of the loss with respect to the weights, because when you get to this point where the loss is minimal, according to this loss function here, I say that this value of weight is the one that gets me the lowest loss uh, for this specific set of weights and this specific set of data samples that I'm re uh, fitting the, the method on, okay? Okay, I, ho I hope this was clear. This was just a recap so far, right? We have discussed when this thing works and when it doesn't work. So for example, the linear regression, as you can expect, works for linear case. But when you move to more complicated case, which we're going to discuss today, for example, the exclusive OR problem, right? That no longer can satisfy your needs. And then you're going to see how we can make the, test, the, the method more robust and more complex so we can uh, uh, start to tackle like more complicated problems. Very well. So I discussed that in the previous slide, right? So like moving away from being just a 1D case where we have loss by a one specific weight, you can imagine that like each one of these weights, they actually correspond to a dimension, right? In this uh, landscape that's characterizing what's my overall loss given the set of weights, right? So like here it's saying V, but you can imagine that this is actually W, right? So like those are the weights that are uh, determined by the uh, model that I'm training, right? And then in, just as we did for the 1D one, the one case, in this case, we're also trying to find this point of minimal here, right? And at this point, I believe that you guys understand the concept that like at this point, the derivative with respect to the weights is equal to zero. And then we say that this is either the local minima, which like can be the case, right? If the derivative is equal to zero, it can also be a local maxima, right? So we are gonna see today some of the techniques that you can use to inspect if that's the case and how to get away from that. Because if you put as the stopping criteria for you to stop changing the weights as simply having the derivative equal to zero, you might be falling one of these traps or like one of these points that are not optimal for solving your task. And like we're gonna, people have thought about that a lot, right? And we're gonna discuss some of these techniques today. We discuss regularization. So like one of the things, the cool things about regularization is that if you make sure that the model, the model is regularized by forcing that these weights, they're sort of distributed over all the features or predictors of your data, right? You also enforce the problem to be more convex, which like by convex, you can understand the uh, loss landscape that sort of looks like this bow shape that you see here. And if that's the case, we increase the, our likelihood, our chance of finding what's this uh, point of minima that's optimal for solving our problem. Okay, very well. But as we have emphasized so far, like we, we have been discussing about getting a problem that looks like this, but in reality, the problems that we're gonna find in the wild, they actually correspond to like that. That's why it's so important to have more robust optimization such that you can either try to force this loss landscape to look more like this, right? Or prevent you from getting stuck in these undesirable uh, points of like, uh, minima, uh, local minima or local maximums, okay? So just to summarize what you have seen so far, right? Essentially is to uh, take advantage of all these basic statistics, right? Uh, multivariate is statistics, right? And uh, repage that. And essentially, if you, you're thinking, oh, that's uh, nothing else than what I have learned like in my statistics class, you're completely correct, right? That the change here is that now we have an efficient way of tweaking these weights, right? In order to approximate what's the desirable values, right? And this process of like doing this iteration of the data in order to approximate to a specific value, it's essentially what we have been calling machine learning so far, right? But now we are moving to what machine learning stands for nowadays in the field, which most of it's like with respect to neural networks, okay? So this ends the recap so far. And then now we're gonna move on to perceptrons, okay? 
any standing question with respect to what we have discussed so far? Um, I, I do actually, I wanted to open up yeah. the, the slide that I had a question on, but this was on, I wasn't here last time, I'm sorry, there, there was on on kernels. So we had, it was the slide where we had uh, the plot of two classes and you had an inner circle and an outer circle, right? And those, we had to apply a kernel so that we could linearly separate them. Mm -hmm. And right. there was this plot where we, I guess, used the square transformation and it turned from a 2D plot to a 3D plot. And I was wondering, I didn't get what the third dimension was. So the third dimension, so the kernel trick essentially stands for increase the dimensionality of your problem, right? In a way that's like, because the assumption here is that increasing the dimensionality of the problem usually gives you like more leverage for trying to uh, either separate or get like a, a more accurate regression, right? Mm -hmm. So the third dimension is nothing else than a no linear combination of the two dimensions that already exist. Okay, okay, so that could be like a, a, the multiplication of the two or the square of the two and the summation of the two, depending on what's the, the transformation that you're using, yeah, which I can okay. give you more details afterwards. Okay, thank you. Okay, so it was a, okay, it was just a function of these two inputs. Um, Correct. Cool. That's right. Okay. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Very well. So like for the sake of time, I'm going to move on. So like uh, feel free to reach out to me during the break so we can like uh, address more specific questions. Okay. So, okay, so like from in this transition from support director machine to perception, right? So like, let's recap what was the goal of the support director machine. So I hope you remember that in SVM, what we're trying to do was to, to find this optimal hyperplan, right? In a n-dimensional space, right? Since this was a 2D, which, so the hyperplan actually consists in just a line, right? That the, distinctly classifies the data points, right? Now the perception, on the other hand, and I, I hope you remember this figure on the right, is not necessarily trying to find the optimal hyperplan, but rather any hyperplan that can classify these points, right? So now if we move on to what's the effectively, what's the loss for a classification test, so we can keep in mind like what the support vector machine for classification was doing, right? You're going to realize that this factor here is exactly the same factor that we have before. So you guys remember the hinge loss, what the hinge loss was trying to do? So the hinge loss, what, what the goal was, was essentially to compare if the product of the model output, right? Which in this case here corresponds to, oh, I, I zoom in here. Okay, let me try to turn on the notation very quickly. Is this working? Okay, perfect, yeah. So what this loss was trying to do is essentially by comparing what's the model output to the ground truth. So you guys remember that Y here is always going to correspond to the output of my math, of my model, right? Uh, the, to the ground truth. And this corresponds to the output of my model, okay? If the two of them are agreeing, so like, let's say that the two possible classes were uh, one and minus one, right? If the product, so, if the product of y and the model output, so let's call it f of x for simplicity, right? So that would be the product. If the two of them are green, so like the ground truth was one and my model output was also one, this is equal to one, therefore greater than zero. Then I say that this classification is correct. So you see that like there is nothing to be done. The loss is equal to zero, right? On the other hand, if there is disagreement between the two of them, Therefore, these products should be less than zero, right? And in this case, I have a loss that I should try to minimize. So it's simple like this. But there was an, another factor on the SVM, right? Which was also that I was trying to find this optimal hyperplan by also trying to minimize the norm of the weights. You guys remember that? Vaguely? Right. So like, I no longer have this factor in this function. Therefore, the position of these hyperplanes is no longer being optimized. You see, all the time focus on is just in the separation of the two, the two classes. Good? Okay, now with respect to how we feed in the data, right? Let me clear this. So this is exactly what we saw before, right? So like here you can imagine that we have data X, right? And I have some label Y associated to it. So 
X, it's multidimensional, right? So like you can imagine that X actually con uh, consists of like several features, X1, X2, X3, all the way to Xn, right? And those are the samples that I have, correct? So those are features of my data, right? And these are the weights that I assign to each one of these features. So, so far, all we are doing is exactly what we saw here with linear regression, correct? Because after I do the multiplication of these features by the, the respective weights, I sum all of them, which is exactly what we are doing here with perceptron, right? So like after I do this multiplication of x1, w1, x2, x w2, x3, w3, I sum all of them, okay? And that corresponds to the output of this summation. So that's the equivalent of the ytx, which is just what we had before, okay? Now, what is the difference between uh, what we are doing the perception and what we were doing the linear regression, okay? Can anyone, uh, does anyone know what's the difference in this case? If like all of this part here is just linear regression, right? So what separates the perception from uh, the linear regression that we saw before? The activation function. The activation function. Perfect. So what is the difference of the activation function in this case? So it's nonlinear, no? That's like... Right. One of the options is to be linear, which is missing here. So like the linear would be, if you just compare it to the same graph, would be this. But then right? chaining them wouldn't do anything, right? Because would not do anything. Yeah. Imagine that's like you have a, a output and then you just do a linear mapping to another space, which would be essentially like using an activation function that's already linear as well. So like you wouldn't necessarily be changing anything, right? So like exactly, yeah. it would be the equivalent of like uh, uh, just changing the weights by a you... scalar. Yeah. 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 Correct. Right. So like the advantage here is that now we can get the output of this uh, linear regressor, right? And do this mapping to uh, no linear space, right? How do we, oh. So this is the output of the linear regressor, right? And do this mapping for a no linear space via this activation function, right? So what happens now, right? So like here, you can say that this uh, X axis corresponds to what's the output of the linear part. Right, so like, let's call it the output of the linear part. Uh, linear part, okay. After you do the summation, right, of like uh, the uh, multiplication of the features by the respective weights, you get to this point here. So like any value that you had in the output of your model, now it's gonna be mapped to this specific space that's defined according to the linear, uh, to the activation function that you have. So for example, if you're using a sigmoid, right? Doesn't matter if the output of this uh, summation of the weights by the features, it's ranging from minus infinite to plus infinite. In this case, it's ranging from minus 10 to 10. This is gonna be mapped to a value that's in the range of zero to one, okay? Uh, which like this X here corresponds to uh, the uh, output of the linear component of the perception, right? And then you compute this uh, little equation here, which corresponds to the sigmoid. The output of the sigmoid is bounded to be between zero and one, okay? The difference between the sigmoid and the hyperbolic tangent is that this value is now bounded between minus one and one. So just the range is different, but you see that the function per se the no linearity is very similar, okay? And we're gonna see when these things are beneficial and not, and essentially when you should be using one activation function versus the other, okay? Now there is another activation function that's less trivial, right? Which is the rectifi uh, rectifier linear unity here, right? Which is relatively recent. I think it's like after uh, 2010. One thing that people realize is that using the sigmoid per se, 
it, it might not be as appropriate depending on the problem that you are dealing with, right? So for example, you might want a linear mapping as we were discussing before, right? But you not necessarily want the negative component of it, right? So let's say that's like, okay, I, I'm learning, I'm training my method to predict three heights, right? Does it make sense for me to be, uh, does it make sense for me to have my model output in negative three heights? What do you guys think? Makes no sense, right? So there is no reason for me to be uh, allowing my method to be making predictions here, right? So what I do in this case is to get the output of the uh, linear component, right? And then I pass through a, a rectifier linear unit. So like now this value is anything that goes below uh, minus one gets cropped. Uh, below zero gets cropped to be zero necessarily, right? So, so now you have a method that's like focusing on, on the range that basically is the range that you care about, right? And in the end of the day, that's the only thing that the activation function is going to add like to the linear components. But let's say that after you have done the normalization of your data, which is one of one step that we have discussed in the previous lecture as well, and you're going to reiterate on that today. Now, uh, after the normalization, uh, the three heights, they are no longer ranging from like 10 meters to like 70 meters, which I think that's where we cropped, right? Like with respect to the maximum trees that we're analyzing this data set. But after the normalization, now they correspond to uh, a range from zero to one, right? So there is no reason for you to keep the linear activation, which is just not having any activation at all. So like it makes more sense for you to be mapping in this range for now. So like we're going to see like oh, what happens when we start using sigmoid, okay? Now, with respect to the other activation functions, right? So for example, uh, those are things that people have figured out like later on. Sometimes by doing this, you increase the stability of, the, uh, of your model. Can you guys guess why that might be the case? Why using a rectifier linear unit might lead to instability? Oh, what's happening? Can I delete this? maybe because you have this you have this big changing point right around zero where it changes quite drastically from being that's correct less than or more than right right i wish i could delete this line right now <laughs> i don't know why it's not deleted it's, i cannot remove it but you're correct so the mode output now has its continuity right it's not even oh, okay now I can use again. Yeah, but that's the discontinuity that you see there, right? So like here, when I have case that might fall near this region, I have uh, underdefined derivatives, right? And we have discussed that if the derivative is underdefined, then I have a problem to uh, train a model that's based on gradients, right? Because the whole point of the gradient is try to investigate how much I can change my loss, right? which basically here stands by the difference of my uh, model output and the true values, right? With respect to the weights, right? But if this is underdefined, so like things that fall in this neighborhood, I cannot use this, right? I cannot use gradient descent. So like that created some instabilities, right? And with that in mind, that's why they created later on methods that they no longer had this sharp transition. So for example, the ELU, has this smooth transition here, where it's not effectively zero, but it's very close to zero, right? And doesn't have this that sharp elbow, but rather like a, a smooth point there. Okay, we are gonna start exploring a little bit uh, what's the uh, actual impact of each one of these uh, decisions with respect to the activation function. And let me try to stop sharing share again to see if I can get rid of all these lines <laughs> because uh, I cannot uh, remove them right now. Let me share again. A tried and tested method, also. just restarting it. <laughs> yeah, it, it managed to go away now. Okay, perfect. So now what we saw here, the perceptron, right? So like, that's just like the same picture that we saw before, just uh, uh, drew in a different way, right? Uh, it was conceptualized basically by taking inspiration from the how the neurons uh, process information, right? So it's like, I discussed that in the very first lecture in the 15 minutes intro lecture, but let's quickly reiterate that. 
So a neuron essentially has these uh, two main parts of it, right? Which correspond to the dendrites, which are like uh, the these ramifications that you see next to the cell body, right? And then you have this axon, right? The dendrites, they receive the inputs that are coming from other cells, right? The cell body essentially stands by uh, computing this input information that's coming in the form of like electrical signals, right? And making a decision if that near is going to broadcast that information or not, right? So you see that there is no such thing as like a continuous level of activity for that neuron, right? So like, it's not like I sum all these inputs that I'm receiving, and then I output something that's proportional to the uh, averaging of all these inputs that I got, but rather like now I have enough inputs and now I can fire an actual potential, right? Which is essentially the signal that's coming from the cell body all the way to uh, through the axon to other neurons that are like sitting in the end of the axon, okay? So that was the difference. So like what people were using until here, right? was essentially by just this component. But if I wanna make this uh, linear uh, summation of the inputs become a little closer to how neurons compute the information, right? And back then, imagine that this like rose and blood age, right? Like, so like we are talking about the seventies here, right? Everyone was trying to understand how the brain, which was like the state of the art with respect to how we process information, like the state of the art of intelligence, which like we can discuss if that still holds true nowadays or not in the era of uh, chat GPT, right? But like, if you want to get closer to that, you should be mimicking the way how the brain or in how the neurons process information. And that was the insight that they had with respect to adding this activation function uh, for like saying, okay, now I no longer have just this, this summation, but I have an activation function that's gonna look like this, right? Like with a very sharp angle, for example. And therefore I get closer to how the neuron it's uh, processing the information, okay? I hope you guys can see this parallel. And that's essentially how I got started in machine learning, to be honest, it was essentially by understanding biophysics of neurons like this and how they will translate to machine learning. And we, we can have this discussion later on. But it's just like so things come together. So you know why I, me as a neuroscientist, uh, I'm teaching this class to you guys. <laughs> Very well. So now one more important thing that we have to like discuss in more details is uh, how we train these methods, right? So we had this very general uh, discussion in the beginning, right? Which essentially stands for like, trying to optimize the loss, right? To reduce this difference between the modal output and the ground truth with respect to the weight, right? So now let's start discussing how this thing actually takes place throughout like several iterations, right? Very well. So error here corresponds to this difference between modal output and ground truth, right? And these here corresponds to all the K weights that I have. Right, so like these k weights that correspond to the several uh multipliers that I'm using for each one of the features, right? Very well. So, this is nothing else than simply like the uh decomposition of the error, right, with respect to uh modal output, which here is these weights that I have trained, and those are the features of the data, okay? This is the uh ground truth value that I have. Okay, and here I'm taking the uh, square of this difference and dividing by the mean, right? So what's the name of this loss that we're using here? This was the mean square error. I think someone said something, but I think that was what you're trying to say, mean square error, correct? Okay, now, Based on that, by how much uh, this loss was changed with respect to these small tweaks that I do in the in the weights, right? I use this value by to adapt these uh, previous weights that I, I was having, right? And get the new set of weights that I'm going to use for the next iteration, right? And then once I have that, I repeat this process, okay? And that's essentially like how the refining process uh, is going to take place, okay? This is formally known as being the stochastic gradient descent, right? And here, I hope I have a, like a little, yeah, a little illustration here, right? 
So I hope you guys can appreciate, right? If you're looking at this from the point of view, uh, from this superior view, like the dorsal view of this graph, right? What we're trying to do is to move along this loss landscape and try to get closer and closer to this region of minima that's here identified by the star, okay? The gradient per se, right? I hope you can appreciate that, is pointing towards the, the direction of the maximum change that you have in this gradient, right? And the process of like doing these several steps essentially uh, takes you like from one point, right? So like, for, let's say that this was the iteration where the weights were equal to I, right? After I had done this computation of the errors, right? So this essentially would correspond to like, how big is this arrow, right? And I update these weights. Now I, I get moved to a different region in this lost landscape. And then I keep reiterating that all the way until I finally converge to the area of minima. Okay, so now we are going to see other factors that might also play a role with respect to how you converge to that, right? So, for example, uh, so far we have been assuming that this is going to be proportional to the error that you have, right? And this derivative with respect to the weights, right? But now, depending on how your loss landscape might look like, right? You could be taking really huge jumps if you're just proportional to this, the gradient of this error with respect to the weights, right? So one thing that people have figured out is that instead of making this jump directly uh, or uh, proportional to the gradient, you can add one more term here, which uh, it's commonly known as the learning rate, right? You which usually is something very small that's a scalar that's used to multiply the gradients, right? Something like 10 to the minus three uh, or 10 to the minus uh, like five, for example. And that's a scalar that's used to basically curb what's the importance of the gradient in any step when you're computing the next weights, right? So what is the uh, consequence? Let me see if I have, no, okay. What is the consequence of using uh, error uh, learning rate that's too small? If this learning rate is too small, essentially you're gonna take more and more steps until you finally converge there, right? So if you're talking about uh, these in terms of a graphic representation, right? Where the loss here corresponds to the Y axis and this corresponds to like uh, iterations, right? Or epochs, if you guys have heard this word before, right? Those are training steps. Okay, so like those would correspond by like full updates of weights in your uh, in your method, like your model, your neuronal network, or even the SVM, right? If you have a learning rate that's too small, you'd have a learning uh, loss that corresponds like this, right? It's very well behaved, as you can see, like it decreases very nicely towards like a, a region of minima, right? As we keep moving towards the region of the minimal uh, loss in this landscape, but it's very slow. <clears throat> now, if you have a learning rate that's too big, what you can have is like these huge jumps, right? All over the loss landscape. So this could look something like that. Okay, ideally, in the ideal world, what we're looking for is like, what is the learning rate that's gonna get you something that's like, looks like a sharp drop and then stabilize. So that's what we're going for ideally. So like, that's the ideal learning rate. This is too small and this one is too large. Okay, either way, the learning rate, it's really important when you're training a neuronal network, okay? Because that's essentially te tells you like how you're gonna be approaching this region of minima that you have here. Is there a formula for estimating what's the ideal learning rate? No, there is no such thing. And that's why what we have is like cookbooks or guidelines with respect to how you do this search, right? Like for the ideal hyperparameters, right? Uh, there are some uh, rules of thumb with respect to like 
how big is your mini batch with respect to like how many samples of your data sets you're analyzing it at any uh, uh, new updates of the weights, right? Or for example, uh, other thing that people take in consideration a lot, it's what's the initialization, right? So for example, how we initialize the weights. Usually we have been talking about initializing these weights as coming from a Gaussian distribution. That's like go going from minus one to one, right? But that's by no means the only rule that you can use. For example, some people they have been using this Gaussian parameterized by also what's the standard deviation of your data. So for example, if the standard deviation of your data, uh, it's uh, less than what's the, the, the normal distribution expected, you might have an initialization that's more appropriate for you. That is a little sharper and looking like this, right? So you get your initialization a little closer to what you expect to be the ideal range already for your, for your uh, model. Okay, and that makes a huge difference because you're no longer just searching like the whole space, right? But you're basically narrowing down to like a more local neighborhood that that's gonna be your actual starting point. Those are all things that they matter a lot with respect to like how you set up the problem that you're gonna be approaching. Okay, any questions with respect to that? Like, so, so far I'm just discussing the stochastic gradient because we already have been talking quite a lot about how to uh, do this computation of like how much the error is impacted by any small change that I do in the weights, right? So we have formalized that in terms of computing the derivatives or like for the cases where we have like multiple dimensions, the gradients, right, of the error with respect to the weights. We have seen the mean square error several times, right? And now we finally came to the rule of how these weights, they are updated throughout like the several steps. Uh, I see uh, some raised hands. Uh, let me open the video again so I can see your faces. Okay, yeah, please. Uh, who went first? I don't know. Uh, maybe, yeah, Valdrich, please. All right, yeah. Uh, I have a question regarding how does this fit in with uh, if the curve is not very uh, smooth, your loss is not very smooth. In that case, uh, should we use a high learning rate or a low learning rate, or does it really matter? If the loss is not very, so if this loss landscape is not very smooth, we should be using a bigger or smaller learning rates. Is yes, that your question? that's what I'm uh, curious about. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and in fact, there are several other approaches that people have used for that, uh, which we're going to be discussing in a little bit. So those are other optimizers that better account for like no smooth uh, loss functions. And so if you can bear with me, for another like half an hour, we are going to discuss that. So I don't get into uh, ahead of myself. Is that for okay? Sure. Yes, no problem at Excellent. all. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, and then we have Martin. Uh, yeah, what's stochastic about this gradient descent? Just the initial value, right? The, the initial values. state, yeah. Okay, cool. Correct. And then the other yeah. one, I think you could also, on the learning rate, I think there's also methods mm -hmm. to learn the learning rate, right? It kind of adjusts based on fluctuations in, in your loss function and tries to smooth it out. Over time. Correct. Yeah. So first of all, yeah. So there are optimizers that they also uh, change the learning rate per se throughout the process of, of optimization. And that's also a thing that you're going to see once we discuss the more modern optimizers in a little bit, in about like half an hour. So your question is also going to be addressed in, in 30 minutes. Uh, and on the top of that, we also have hyperparameter search techniques, right? Because like, as you can imagine, the learning rate per se is a hyperparameter. So you can include that like a, as one of the things that you'd like to be searching over. And we are going to discuss that like in the next lecture though. So, uh, and then we have, uh, Alex, you had a question? Oh, but, um, but I just suggested whether we can use some machine learning methods, uh, some, some other methods to search for the optimal values of this learning rate and or other hyperparameters like like meta machine learning, something like this. Correct. Yeah. And yeah, the question is yes, there are methods for that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Any, um, any other questions? I think this is very relevant. And I, I, I uh, as Valdrich was pointing already, right? Like that is a problem that you might face because in fact, like if this loss function becomes complex, right? 
doing this simple optimization with respect to the gradients only, right? And trying to minimize the gradient, the, this metric where you get the error equal to zero is not appropriate, right? Because here I would have the gradient equal to zero as well, right? Also here. And because we have this representation here, clearly we can identify that that's not the, the point where we want to stop, but rather somewhere around here, right? So like, could a bigger learning rate help us? Let's think about that. So like, if I compute the gradient here, right? Imagine that this is a, a ball that's rolling and basically the learning rates would correspond to like, what's the acceleration that we have to this ball, right? If we have like a, a very small learning rate, that could take us like somewhere around here and eventually get somewhere around here, right? Okay, but if the learning rate is big, that would, could bounce here, throws us all the way to this other wall, right? The next step would be somewhere like around here, then back here, you know? So like big learning rate is tricky, okay? And for example, when ChatGPT was released, right? You can imagine that this loss uh, landscape is not defined just by the data by itself, but also like how big the model is, right? Because imagine that like in this little represented representation that we have here, right? This corresponds to the loss, like the, the height, right? And then these here and here, they correspond to weight one and weight two. So this is a two, it's still a 2D problem, right? But like how many parameters do we have in chat GPT? Does anyone know? It's like in the scale of billions of parameters, right? So like we're talking about a, a billion Per, uh, billion D space where we're doing this optimization. So like we, we don't have the, the luxury of doing this inspection, right? So like what they released several guidelines with respect to how to do this training properly. And one of them was the usage of something that we're gonna discuss uh, later on. Uh, actually, I don't have that in these slides, which like besides using a more modern optimizer, right? also using learn schedulers. So like that's a, a, another auxiliary technique where you're changing your learning rates, not just with respect to like uh, the optimization per se, right? Uh, the, the optimizer, but also changing the learning rate according to like a, a cosine function, right? Or like a little warm up where you hold the learning rate like to a, a linear increase and then you start decreasing. Because that gives you like some leverage of like bumping around like several times. And then you get to experience a little bit of how this loss landscape looks like, right? Because you, you have been like in several points with like uh, actually the uh, cosine annealing scheduler it starts with a very high learning rate and then it goes lower, right? So like while you are here, you have a very high learning rate to get to explore a little bit of uh, the overall loss landscape, and then it starts slowing down, right? But if you, in this point you're in a local minimum, right, you just get stuck in there, right? That's why they artificially take the learning rate back up. So like it's forced you to start moving again, you know? So like there are all these little tricks that they, they were created exactly because like it's very complicated to train these things. Okay, yeah, okay, let's, let's not get uh, carried away by this. Okay, any other questions? Maybe I can ask another question, if it's fine. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was wondering about, uh, so does it go back to its uh, lowest, uh, lowest loss, or does it continue along the gradient? Supposing it takes a wrong step and uh, because of a high learning rate and the loss increases, then does it uh, go back or only follows the gradient? That, that's a great question, uh, but let me try to reformulate that to make sure that I answer it correct. So you're you're asking like, okay, let's say that throughout the process of like uh, minimizing, right? The process of like finding the best uh, uh, weight, I might have passed through the lowest loss and then all the other steps that I took during the optimization actually took me to a bigger loss. Is that yes. what you're saying? Yes, exactly. Right, yeah. So if that is a global uh, uh, minima, right? So it's not a local minima. If you keep in, uh, increasing and decreasing the learning rates, like over a cosine annealing function or something, 
you have a chance of returning to that point. So like how this is going to look like, and these are the type of loss uh, curves that I see all the time. They look like this in the beginning, right? Then the method finds like a sort of sweet spot, gets stuck there for a little bit, sometimes goes back up. So this is loss, okay? And these, again, those are iteration steps. So that's epoch here. Then it goes back up a little bit. It kind of gets stuck in that local minimum for, for a couple of epochs, as you can see here, right? It escapes because we start increasing the learning rate, and then finally it starts converging down again because it, it keeps iterating and finding like, oh, actually, I'm not entirely done, right? But this can happen as well, where like the loss actually just keeps going and doesn't stop. So what we do here is call, is to save checkpoints, right? So like every time that I get the lowest loss, the lowest loss with respect to what's the lowest loss that I have recorded, right? I say, oh, actually I have like a new best model with respect to the loss, right? So that's a checkpoint that I save. Another thing is called early stopping. So this, the closest that we get to like uh, the free lunch theorem, right? Where it's like, there is no silver bullet with respect to making sure that I'm always gonna find what's the lowest loss, right? What's the optimal point or like what's the global minimum? There is no guarantee that that's ever going to happen, right? We, but we can get as close as possible, which is by using this trick. So early stop essentially stands for, you know, after I have reported what's the lowest loss, now count up to like 100 epochs. So like for how many more epochs I'm going to keep training. If that doesn't happen, just kill the training process right here because I assume that there, there is no gonna be like a better point than the one that I already passed it through. So like, even though I already moved away from that, like the global minimum, right? I always have recorded what were the weights that were associated to this point. So like I have all the weights associated to it. So that's the way that I'm gonna use for like inference later on. Does it make sense? Yes, definitely. And the uh, okay. loss goes uh, increases because you're looking at the validation set and not the set that you're training on, right? Otherwise, it would always keep reducing. Uh, yeah, so that's a different problem. So that's essentially what we call overfitting, right? Which may, yeah. means that like the weights that I keep refining, they only get better and better for the training set, but not for the validation set. But what we're describing in this case here would be like a more general problem where we are just bouncing around in the loss landscape per se. So like assuming that this uh, uh, sequence of uh, weight chains, right? They're just taking like in different points of this loss landscape. So like assuming that like, there is no such thing as overfitting, which there is, but like assuming that the loss that you observe for training is the same for the validation. Okay. This can still happen, what we described here. But Be because uh, the loss is being optimized to reduce it. So it should always keep reducing, right? But the, the steps that we're taking, they are proportional to the gradient, right? That's what you have to keep in mind. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. that might take us to different regions of this loss landscape. Okay. That makes sense. Right. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Cool. Great questions so far. Uh, so let me see how far away we are from the. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna finish that. We do the the quiz and we go for a break. Does it sound good? Okay. Great. Yeah. So like now we have discussed this gradient descent, right? Uh. I feel like I already discussed all these things, so I'm not going to recap with you. I'm going to leave that for the quiz, okay? All right, so let's go straight for the quiz. Okay, so you guys know the, the, the instructions, right? So please scan the QR code or use this link. I'm going to send the link in the chat just to make life easier as well. Uh, where is the chat? Okay, so it's here. So you guys have it there. So let's take a quick quiz with respect to the things that we had discussed both in this lecture and the previous lecture. All right. Okay, is it up for you guys? So you should be seeing now a question that's named uh, perceptron number one, what's a yeah. gradient in the context yes. of machine learning? Yeah, so 
please, uh, you can start voting. So like we're going to do as we did before, right? Uh, when you reach like a quota, uh, how many students we have today, Pepe? Uh, 19 without us. Okay, so let's shoot for 15 people then. I think that's a reasonable number. In the meantime, I'm opening the notebook because that's what we're going to do right after this. Uh, maybe share this screen so we can look at the results together. Uh, let me do that. Okay, can you guys see the poll now? Okay, great. So most people said that the rate of, so what's gradient in the context of machine learning? So most people have said so far, how many votes did they get? Only nine. Okay. Come on, people. Uh, let's at least 12. <laughs> then. Okay, but in any case, you already have seen that. So like the correct answer, as most people have indicated, right? The, the gradient corresponds to the rate of change of a function with respect to its parameters, right? What are the parameters that most often we have been discussing about? The weights and biases. Weights and biases. That's correct. What are hyperparameters? Because I also have mentioned hyperparameters before, right? But what's the difference between parameter and hyperparameter? Well, the hyperparameters talk more about the model itself, like uh, where the mm. weights and biases are the link between our input data and our prediction. And Correct. the hyperparameters yeah. so, help us get train those values or get those values. Right, yeah. Some of these hyperparameters are, for example, the learning rate that you have discussed, right? For the SVM, that was the slack variable C, right? And the epsilon, which are things that are like, predefined before even start optimizing the weights of the method. Okay. Very good. Very good. So next question, activate. So what is a perception? This question should be active for you now. Six people. In the meantime, let me log this in. Okay, let's check the answers. Oh, we have a divide here. Okay. So what's a perceptron? A type of activation functionally, function commonly used in neuronal networks? Hmm. A machine learning algorithm used for binary classification tests or regression? Okay, this is concerning. <laughs> <laughs> so like the, the answer is B, right? So like, as you guys, I hope you remember. So let's go back here. So this is the perceptron, right? So you see that the perception is this whole architecture, right? The activation function, we had a couple of activation functions that we discussed, which were these guys here, sigmoid, hyperbolic tangent, relu, and so on, right? But the architecture per se is a machine learning algorithm, right? That's meant for uh, training these weights, right? To, gather, to get you closer to a value that you're trying to regress or separate classes, right? Therefore, okay, more people just change the answers there. So is a machine learning algorithm used for binary classification or regression test? Okay. Any questions with respect to that? Anything that perhaps uh, was not entirely clear? If not, I'm going to move on. But like, feel free to reach out to me during the break. Uh, yes. In, in, in practice, if you just use a single perceptron, is that just a... Religious regression. regression, 
a logistic regression or like depending on your activation function it's like a yeah. logistic or a... funny enough, funny enough yeah if you're using a perception with a sigmoid then it's a logistic regression yeah, yeah. isn't that funny how you you get to approximate other types of regression by just changing the type of activation function and i skip that and like usually i love talking about that but like for the sake of time i had to skip there is this uh, paper that basically says that perceptrons, they, they are universal computational engines, right? So like if you just keep stacking perceptrons, you can approximate any of the previous regression or classification algorithms that we have. I mean, I right? think neural networks just are keep... universal approximators, right? You can, any function you could approximate with a big enough model. Exactly, exactly, data. yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Yes, and by single perceptron, you refer to the simplest possible neural network consisting of only one uh, neuron, yes? Which yeah, is, it would not uh, even be called a network, right? Because that would be a N of one, so like that would be just a one neuron, yeah. So like if I keep stacking neurons, right, I, I can build something as complicated as an algorithm can, that can generate text from uh, just a prompt or generate a full image just from a description of it, right? like really uh, fantastic was, things yeah but a single mm -hmm. neuron uh, could uh, uh, generate like logistic regression yeah a uh, single neuron could ge could well, generate sigmoid, logistic mm -hmm. regression as long as you stack a sigmoid as its activation function okay okay all right next question then so uh, i'm trying to, to... Uh, yes please perceptron and neuron what is this two two is, is these are interchangeable they're similar, similar concept, right? right so like you're gonna see people referring to it as neurons depending on like who you're talking to right for example i refuse to call a perceptual neuron because like there are several other things several other details that were left out right so i really don't want to be carried away but i just love this topic so much so what's the difference you know like by for example if you're talking about uh uh, uh, sigmoid, for example, right? You really have seen that the sigmoid looks like this, right? Sort of like this. It's bounded by this range, right? Now, if I get like a rectifier linear unit, it looks like this, okay? On the other hand, what the actual neuron uh, responding to uh, the inputs looks like, it looks like this, okay? Does any of the activation functions that we have seen so far actually recapitulate such behavior? No, it doesn't, right? But there is new area of research that they call neuromorphic, right? Where they are trying to build neuronal networks that they do respond in terms of spikes and not as like this continuous crap that you see here, okay? Okay, no no more comments about that, but like, yeah, catch me on the break if you want to learn more about it. Okay, so, all right. If we had time, I would also explore like all these different types of uh, uh, other regressions that we overlooked. So like the logistic, right? The logistic regression. I will talk about like how the perception falls in that category as well, but like for the sake of time, unfortunately I had to skip that. Okay, so let's continue the, the things that matters, right? So like, I uh, hope you guys are already voting. So uh, the next question was, in a perception, how are the weights updated during the learning process? At least 10 people. Okay, almost there. Okay, let's go for the, the answers. So the correct answer is D, right? I saw someone change the, their answer there. So yeah, like apparently there is no question about it, right? So like a perception is trained by adjusting the weights proportionally to the difference between the predicted and the actual output, right? And that applies for both classification and regression, right? The difference is that in the uh, regression case, we are trying to approximate what's, reduce what's the difference between model output and the ground truth, right? 
And the other hand, what we're trying to do in the classification is basically find a loss that, base, that accounts for how many mistakes I'm making, right? So you guys remember the hinge loss, for example, is the product of model output and the ground truth. And then I compare what's the signal of this product. Okay, apparently no questions about it. So I think that's the last question. So please go for this. Which of the following activation functions can be used in a perception? Oh, you should not be seeing that. That's a very easy one. So like, let's go straight for the answer. All the above. I, I just showed that slide again. So like, I believe no one has a question about this one. And then finally, five, what's the main limitation of a single layer perception? Hmm. We have been discussing that quite a lot, but I haven't put that in my slide. So like, uh, let's see how much you're actually paying attention to what I say as well. <laughs> Um, this one doesn't show on my phone. Oh, it's not active. Thanks for, for letting me know. Oh, now it's there. Uh, refreshing worked. Mm -hmm. Okay, 10 people. Let's, let's get you 10 people. One more. One more. Okay, it's not gonna happen. Oh, actually I got I lost one answer. So most people believe that it can only solve linear separable problems. And that is correct. Okay. Like, yeah, I hope you have been paying attention, right? So that we have been discussing a lot with respect to how the perceptron is just a linear regression with an activation function, right? So the activation function help us to map the range of the outputs to a desirable range, right? And that's it. But in the end of the day, it has exactly the same problems that the linear regression had, which that it can only solve linear separable problems. Any questions about it? Because I see that like people are voting all over the place. So like, any questions with respect to that? For example, uh, it requires a large amount of training data. Well, that basically stands for any machine learning, right? That's not a problem that just the uh, Perceptron has, right? It's computationally expensive. Actually not. The, the Perceptron is very cheap, like as, as a learning algorithm on its own. It cannot handle categorical data. Well, it can, as long as you do this transition from like a category to like an integer that's represented, right? Then, then you can. And we have been talking about just like linear separable problems. Therefore, we are assuming that there are only two classes, right? Okay. Did I have one more question? Okay. So let's do this last one and then we go for the break. Okay, last one. Okay, yeah, you all got it correct. It may get stuck in local meaning, but depending on the initial weights, right? Uh, so apparently there are no questions about this one. So I'm gonna just leave it, okay? Guys, uh, so what, what do you think about it? So should they just take a, like a break now and then we come back with the tutorial? Okay. Yes, perfect, yes. Let's come back at uh, 35. Three, five. Okay, that's good. Any chance that perhaps you can make it a little shorter today? Perhaps like 30, just so I get okay. like in through the tutorials. Make okay, sure let's try that. 30, guys. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you. See you in a little bit. It's coming up, but not yet. 
Here says the sharing is paused. Resume share. What's going on? Let me try one more time. This is not working? No. Black screen. It says you have started, but we don't see anything. No, yeah, it's a black screen. Hmm. One more time. Let me close some of these windows. There it is. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah is putting these like, the same. security measures. Okay. Like, so if you have like a yay or sensitive oh, okay, information no, yes. tab open, you have to close it before you can share your screen. Here is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what I was going to show, I forgot what I was going to show. What were you talking about? The hidden, uh, the hidden layers. The activation right? functions. Activation or hidden layers. Ah, yeah, yeah. So like, yeah. So what I was saying is that uh, they do recommend to use rect, uh, rect, rectifier linear units, the ReLU, for the neurons in the hidden layers, which looks like this, right? But this book was released in 2015, which like for machine learning uh, age, it's actually quite old, right? So like now they recommend to use the ELO because of the issues that we mentioned before, right? Because those, they have like some uh, instability issues with respect to things that are happening near zero, right? Because you see that there is this like sharp transition. So like now they say that the ELO is the best way to do it. So yeah. ELU for hidden layers, so like the other neurons, and the neuron that's giving you the output, you use either sigmoid if it's between zero and one, uh, hyperbolic tangent if it's between minus one and one. If you don't have an upper bound, you can either use ReLU there, ReLU for like the very last neuron, it's okay, or use ELU. Okay. But like, yeah, if you're doing something that's like a natural number, for example, like a real uh positive number you can use relu no problems all right but uh the alpha parameter is it a hyper parameter or, or is it optimized uh, during training the in lu sorry the alpha in lu uh this alpha basically is going to tell you like how negative you're willing to go right so like that's what this alpha is doing here Right. So like if you want it to be as close as possible to zero, because let's say that's like you're predicting three heights again, right? There is no negative three height. But the ELO, it's just for the sake of uh trainability, right? As we are discussing about using that in the hidden layer. The hidden layer is just there to make the computation more uh increase the capacity of the computation, right? Give more flexibility to the, to the method to leverage the input information, right? Yeah. So like what's the actual range doesn't really matter, right? So like you can go negative in that case. So you can increase the alpha as, as you want, but that's also a hyperparameter. So you you have to define that a priori. All right. Yep. I think I got it all like need to just try some things now. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's what most of machine learning is, is like try out some things and you know, like make educated guesses and then explore that because the space of guesses that you can take, they're borderline infinite at this point, right? So if you're going to explore all the possibilities, you're going to take like several years to come up with like the right solution. So it's more like how things work, right? And what's going to get me closer to what's the desirable output. That's essentially what machine learning is. Yep. Okay, great. So we're going to do a tutorial, right? So please go to that file that is named uh, Perceptron Inter Class 1. Is everyone there? So you should see something that looks like this. Yeah, Perceptron Inter Class 3. Inter Class 3, that's correct. Okay, so maybe I start talking just for the sake of time, right? 
So let's just talk, start talking by uh, the uh, packages that you're using, right? So at this point, you you're very familiar with this SQ, SK Learn uh, package, right? That's what we use for random forests. We also use that for uh, uh, support of vector machine, right? And here you're still using it, it, but for different purpose. So like I'm using the train test split function, the one that splits like training set and test set. That's still applicable to what you're doing here. And I'm using the metrics. So like I'm using the way how the R score is computed by this library to infer what's the class of our method, right? Pandas for loading the data set because it's a table, right? So like it's very convenient to visualize things with Panda. Uh, SciPy is like also for statistics and you're gonna see that in a little bit. Uh, Matplotlib for plotting, NumPy for matrices and Torch is what we're going to be using to implement neuronal networks from now on, right? So like Torch stands for like PyTorch, right? PyTorch, it's one of the main libraries for implementing deep learning. I don't know if you guys remember from the options that I said in the very first lecture, that's an intro 15 minutes class, but there are basically three main branches of like libraries for to implement uh, machine learning, where it's PyTorch, TensorFlow, and Keras, right? Uh, Keras is not nearly as popular as TensorFlow and PyTorch. PyTorch is kept and maintained by Facebook, uh, Meta now, and uh, TensorFlow is kept by uh, Google, right? Uh, the documentation for PyTorch is way better than TensorFlow. Therefore, you have more users in TensorFlow. So that's why we are going to uh, you have more users for PyTorch than TensorFlow. So that's why we're using TensorFlow. Okay. So this figure you already familiarized, that's basically what we discussed with respect to what's the architecture of this perception, right? I put a uh, link here for you guys to read a bit more about like the perception overall and what's the different types of activation function, which we have covered like some of the principal ones, sigmoid, hyperbolic tangent, relu, elu, and so on. So you can get like more uh, options there. And at this point, we are uh, we already discussed that several times. What's the difference between the perceptron and a simple linear regression, right? Which uh, I, I'm going to assume that you're all very uh, confident about this answer, which is that's just the activation function. Okay. Any questions so far? If there are no questions, then let me zoom in here. Okay. So, okay, so the way how PyTorch works is that the models that we defined, we define them in terms of classes, right? I'm assuming you guys are familiarized with Python, so I don't need to explain what a class is. Am I correct? Does anyone has a, a okay, so like a class basically is gonna say, okay, I have this object that has the following properties, right? And then within this object perception, right? which belongs to the class PyTorch, right? It's a model from PyTorch that I'm creating. I have the following attributes. My cats are destroying the house out there. So I have the following attributes. So I have this uh, linear layer, right? Which the layer that's gonna be taking the inputs. So it has this, the input of this linear layer has the same size of features that I have, okay? And that's the output of the linear layer. So like what I'm projecting to, that would be the equivalent in the case of the perception to this, right? So this is, would be the equivalent of a linear layer, what we're doing here, where we're, we're taking the inputs, multiplying with the weights of this linear layer and projecting to somewhere else, right? If you're doing machine learning, deep learning in this case, which we're gonna be doing in, in hopefully in half an hour, right? We would be projecting that to other neurons, right? So like, then you have a different size for the output. Okay, so I'm gonna make it general. So like output size is gonna be a variable in this case, right? What comes next is activation function that we wanna use. So for example, in this specific case, right? We are using ReLU, okay? The, this consider the comment that's coming after. So that's how you define a ReLU. If you wanted to use a hyperbolic tangent, that would be 10H. If you want to use sigmoid, then you write sigmoid in there. And we're gonna be using those in a little bit, okay? Here I put an option for like turning on and or off the activation function. If I turn off the activation function, right? So like if I say I set activation function equal to zero, essentially I have, 
if I bypass the activation function, what would I have in this case? A linear regression. Linear regression. Ex excellent. A, a linear regression model. Everything clear? Any questions so far? Right? So this is just uh, reiterating the things that I just said very well. So now we come to this section here, right? So like before we get started with the tree height data sets, let's do a, a case where we can explore a little bit the benefits of the activation functions and so on, okay? So like for that, I'm gonna create a fake data set, okay? So I can use this function that comes from SQL Learn as well, right? Which is called data sets, where I say, I want to create some data set, okay? That's gonna be used for regression problem. I would like this data set to have 100 features, uh, 100 samples, sorry, and two features, all right? And then I can say like, wh what's the way how this thing is gonna be sampled, okay? N I'm gonna create a trained data set and a test data set using that, okay? So that's essentially what I'm doing here, right? So now I'm gonna plot this data set, okay? This data set has two features and here I'm plotting X and Y, and the color represents what's the value, right, of these each one of these points. So that's what you're observing here. So you can see that there is a clear gradient going from lower Y to uh, lower values of Y to a greater value of Y, right? And that's the test data set. So they roughly correspond to the same distribution, right? So like you see that they, they, the uh, distribution of the training set and the test data set, they overlap. So therefore, they are coming from the same distribution, which is essential for like machine learning in general, because you cannot be predicting uh, training your model in one distribution and trying to run inference in another distribution, right? This would be what people call like an out of distribution application, which is a problem that people investigate quite uh, a bit, like in machine learning overall, right? What would be the equivalent of that for like the, uh, like in a real uh, world case? That would be the equivalent of you making predict uh, training your model to predict trees that only range from like 10 meters to 30 meters. And then you go run a prediction like in uh, the Sequoia National Park, right? Like where you just have, you have never seen trees that big before. Okay. Very well. So what we do next here is basically to plot the distribution right of this uh data set so like here i'm plotting what's the distribution of the uh x values right so like they are ranging from minus two and two as you could clearly see here the y values they are also ranging from minus two and two and the uh values of these points we are here quantified by the color they are ranging from minus 200 to 200 okay all right so now what we're gonna do right uh i I haven't done that yet. So like, let, let's describe this part first. So now I'm creating an object called model that comes from the class perceptron, right? The inputs for the perception. So like some of the attributes that they can set in the perception are the input size. So like the input size, if you guys remember, is like how many inputs I'm expecting to get with respect to number of features, right? So these correspond to the number of features of the data that I'm gonna give. For this data set, how many features do I have? Like two or even one? I had two, X and Y, right? I had two features, just an X and Y. And the other one is already what I'm trying to predict, which is the uh, color of the point, correct? So like the input size, which is the number of features is equal to two, okay? And the output, I'm trying to predict one value. Therefore, the output size is equal to one. Okay. Okay. Since this is a regression, we have our uh, old friend mean square error loss. So that's the criteria that we're going to be using, right? That's essentially how you set what's the metric or the performance P that we talk about like so often, right? That's how you set that in PyTorch. Okay. And here we're instantiating what's the optimizer that I'm going to be using. So like inside of uh, Torch, uh, dot optimin. You have all these optimizers, like so far we haven't talked about many of them, but we have talked about the stochastic gradient descent, right? 
which I uh, hope you guys remember is essentially talking about how I'm going to leverage the information that I, is coming from the model output. So the Y hat, right, that I have, how I'm going to compare that to the uh, ground truth information, which in this case, the subtraction of the two, the square of this, uh, the difference between the two and divided by the number of samples that I have in the batch. And this is the learning rate. So like by how much I'm going to take a step toward in the direction of the gradient that was computed. Any questions so far? So we have defined so far, what's the model that we're going to be using, right? What's the criteria and what's the optimization technique, okay? That's all we need to like train our first perceptron, okay? Any questions? No? Okay. So now I am going to train the, the model on that, okay? So like now what I do, uh, oh, Sorry, first I'm gonna do just an evaluation with the method. So like, let's say that we initialize the, mat the model, which is what we did here, right? So this initialization is done by default with a Gaussian distribution. So these weights, they were not trained at all, right? So like they were just randomly sampled. The weights were randomly sampled from a Gaussian distribution, okay? So I'm gonna load this model. So like you see that I'm calling model evolve here. I'm gonna pass the test data set through this model and get a prediction. So that's the y pred that we have there, okay? If I do that and I compare the true values, which I hope you guys remember was ranging between like uh, minus 200 to 200, right? And I compare it to the prediction of this output, this is what we get, right? So this model is terrible, right? Keep in mind that it was not trained. So like you see that the R value is negative, right? So like you see that there is a negative uh, linear relationship between the prediction and the true value, right? So that means that this model is total garbage, okay? Very well. Now let's train the perceptron, right? So like now we are gonna finally try to, to train this model. So like now I'm changing from evaluation mode to train mode. Right, so that means that like the uh, operations that I'm going to be performing from now on, they should be accumulating uh, gradients, so I can optimize the model. Before, when I have model eval, right, I'm basically saying like I don't keep track of anything that I'm doing with this model because I have no interest of like doing anything with these computational graphs that are kept by the uh, PyTorch library so you can optimize the model, right? So this runs fast, that's inference mode, and this is training mode, okay? So that's essentially the difference between model.train and model.eval. Okay, so next we say, by for how many iterations I'd like this thing to be training, right? So like, uh, I'm gonna train this model for 1000 epochs. So like, how many training steps, how many optimization of these weights am I gonna have? 1000. Okay, very well. So like now we have a training loop that's gonna go over these epochs. So in each one of these epochs, we're gonna do the following steps. We are gonna uh, zero the optimizer. So like we can compute what's the gradient uh, in that specific location that we are in the uh, loss landscape, which is defined by the current weight. Okay, so like I zero the optimizer. Now I compute the outputs that are associated to the uh, samples of the training set. So like those are the samples of the training set. So you can imagine that's a table where I have like any samples by just two columns, which were just X and Y that we had defined, right? I'm gonna get this prediction. Now I'm gonna compute the loss. So these loss, you guys remember that the criterion that we have defined was the mean square error. So you see that the criteria could be absolutely anything, right? Like I could be using any type of loss as long as I define what's the right criterion that I'd like to use up there, right? So like the criteria is mean square error. The inputs for criteria, they are always like, what's the prediction of your model and what's the ground truth value that you're trying to approximate, okay? In this case, because we have defined the criteria to be mean square error, now we know it's the, square of the difference between y pred and y train, right? Divided by the number of samples that I have, okay? Now, the backward, okay? The backward computes effectively the uh, gradient that we have discussed so far, right? So like, let me go back here. 
the backward does this for you. You see, that's what the backward does. So it computes the gradient of this loss. That's what's computed with respect uh, to the weights. Okay. In optimizer, each step does the next step, which is okay. Take in consideration what are the weights that I had before, right? And sorry, we are in this case, right? So like, what are the weights that I had before, and update that according to this uh, gradient that you computed and the learning rate that was given to you, right? And give that as the next set of weights that I'm going to be using. So all of that is happening in this for loop. Okay, and then finally, you're just going to be accumulating what's the loss that you're having during the training, so we can compute the 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 uh, loss with respect to the number of epochs of training that we had. Any questions so far? Uh, yes. In in each yeah. epoch, do we show the model all of the data or just single observations and then optimize the model each time? In in this implementation, that's a great question. In this implementation, because I only have like uh, 100 samples, I'm giving all the data. So like every okay. full pass in every epoch, this model is seeing 100 samples with two features. Okay. But yes, if I have, let's say, like millions of samples, right, I cannot present all the samples to the model, right? So like what I do then is batching, right? Which is like, I, I give like the first 100 samples, I do our optimization step, which essentially stands for like computing the loss. I do the uh, computation of the gradients, right? Which is the loss dot backward, right? I do one step with respect to optimizing the weights. Then I move to the next batch. And then I do this step again. So like, you see that I have like several mini batch steps within one epoch in that case. But so here we are not doing batching, but that's a great question. Any other question? And this zero grad is just telling the optimizer, hey, we're looking for a zero gradient, right? That's all that does or? No, no, the no? zero grad, because like you see that, so the uh, optimizer is keeping track of like all these operations that they have been done. So the zero grad basically stands like, I'm starting a new computation of gradients right now. So like, there is no reason for you to keep track of like the gradients that were computed like two epochs before, right? Because I want to compute the gradients with respect to where I am standing right now in the loss landscape. So I zero the gradients in that point. And then I start accumulating again as I keep going through like these steps here. And yes, if... I, I, I could repeat, uh, I repeat what optimizer refers to this. Uh, parameter optimizer, what is this here? So this optimizer, right, was defined up here. Remember that we are saying like the optimizer that I'm using for this task, right, is going to be the stochastic gradient, which is this guy that we had discussed here, right? Yes, okay. So yeah, so that's the uh, optimizer here. In, like, uh, remember that SGD is a class, right, which has attributes associated to it. So I'm creating an object that belongs to the class optimizer SGD, stochastic gradient. The uh, parameters, the attributes of that class are the parameters of the model, right? So like, which in this case are the weights of my model and the hyperparameters associated to them, uh, which we have been using just the learning rate so far. Okay, so that's optimizer. Perfect. So, so here we... now, I... So if we don't yeah. zero grad, if we don't do this, is it just like unnecessary memory usage or does it actually use the old gradients if we don't it's zero gonna them? keep Correct, it's gonna keep the gradients uh, of the previous steps. But well. does it so do like, anything with the old gradients or is it just storing them so I can have a look at them later? And it's bad because it's- no. it, It's bad, right? Because like imagine that so you're keeping gradients, you're accumulating gradients since the first steps, right? So for example, uh, we discussed about moving the loss landscape in this slide, correct? Mm -hmm. Imagine that like here, I compute what's the gradient because I'm gonna take a step in the loss uh, landscape in the same direction of my gradient, right? Now I'm here. Now I'm gonna compute the gradients in this step, but now I'm no longer just using this gradient that's in this step, which should take me here, but rather I have a vectoral uh summation of these two vectors so like my next step mm. it's actually going to be in this direction more or less right 
Now, when I'm going to take the next step, I'm summing this vector, this vector, and the next vector. So like, it's going to take me here, right? So you see that like I'm I'm not converging to where I should be, yeah. right? I want to yeah. compute the gradients just with respect to like where I am, right? So I can make the best guess of in which direction I should be taking the next step in the lost landscape. Yeah. Okay. 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 Curious because I would have thought that that would be the default, like. But I, anyways, I don't want to <laughs> hold off the is it, Yeah. No. But it's a great question. But it's not the default because, for example, when you have a model that has several components to it, right? You cannot, you, you have to specify exactly where you want the gradients to be zeroed, right? So you can start accumulating gradients again, right? Because like I have like model one, model two, model three, all of the, they can have the gradients separate for each one of them, or you might want to sum the gradients of all these three models so you can optimize all of them in one single step, you see? So you have to specify exactly where you want the gradients to be zero so you can start accumulating them. But mm -hmm. that, that's a very interesting uh, question, yeah. Okay, good. Let me delete the stuff. Okay, so if we train this model that we have defined up there using these scripts, that's how the loss is going to look like, right? Which is what we expect it to look like. Remember that like we want this sharp drop, right? And then take like the small incremental steps until it slowly approximate what's the global minima there. Right, which so it should be somewhere around here. Keep in mind that it's extremely easy data set, right? So like this is as easy as it gets because there was a clear trend in the data set. The data set is 2D, so we can even visualize how this uh, loss landscape looks like, right? But things can get a bit more complicated as you're gonna see. Very well, now I have this model that I have trained here. So let's learn, run an inference on it, right? So like I change this to model.eval, Right. So the evaluation of the model uh, gets turned on. So like now I have no accumulation of gradients and any type of regularization that I had implemented, which we haven't discussed yet, is going to be turned off. Right. So like regularizations with respect to dropout and so on, which are things that usually we implement to uh, try to uh, force convexity of the problem. Right. They get turned off with model eval. So here I have absolutely nothing that's been uh, is being accumulated, like with respect to gradients, computational graphs or anything. And I'm simply running an inference, just evaluation, right? And that's what we are doing here. So here we're gonna get the uh, test data set, which is the X test. We're gonna pass it through the model, get a prediction, right? I want to compute what's the loss, right? Of the, with respect to, the model output and what was the ground truth value y test. But as we have discussed, this operation is not going to result in anything that can be used to compute uh, the uh, the gradients, right? In fact, if at this point, after you have done this, you ask for like uh, optimizer.step, you're going to get a error message. It's going to say, oh, I actually have absolutely nothing that I have accumulated from the previous operations for me to be able to uh, compute the gradients here. So like you get an error in this case. Okay. So now we have the Y pred, right? We have the Y stat, uh, Y test, which is the ground truth. Let's compute the statistics. So that's what I use SciPy for. So the SciPy is going to give to me the slope of this line that I'm fitting, the intercept, the R value, P value, and blah, blah. We don't really use these guys for anything. So let's plot these guys. So now we have this model the model outputs represented by the red line okay so that's what no sorry the line here is representing the uh slope okay the scatter here is representing model output in prediction okay so that's the x coordinate and in the y axis we have the true value so that's what you're obtaining here right we see that the R value here is like 0 0.98. It's extremely good, right? So this is after the training. So just to, as you remember, with the simply initialized, a randomly initialized model, we had co completely garbage. And now we have something that looks much better. Okay. Now, remember that the default of the perception was use activation equal to false. Therefore, what we did was nothing else than a simple regression. Okay. Now let's train something more interesting, right? 
let's use activation equal to true. If I have activation equal to true, what is, according to my uh, class perception, what is the activation function that I, I'm going to be using? Uh, ReLU, I think, right? Mm -hmm. The ReLU, precisely. Okay, so now we're going to be training a perception that now has a no linearity on it, which is the ReLU. You guys remember what's the behavior of the ReLU? Only take positive values. And those yeah, are linear. Zero, then. anything that's below zero, right? So like, if it's like negative numbers, just project it to zero. That's essentially what we're going to be doing. So let's see what's going to happen now. So like, you see that the criteria is exactly as the same. So I'm go it's still going to be using the mean square error, right? The optimizer is exactly the same optimizer that I had before. Same learning rate as well. And this is exactly the same training loop that we saw before. Nothing different, right? So like we set the model to train mode. So like, yes, from now on, it start accumulating gradients for me. Epochs, we are using 1,000 epochs as before. We are going to run this uh, little loop that's going to take us like through these 1,000 iteration steps. Then we're going to change this model after these 1,000 steps to evaluation mode because we no longer want to use any type of regularization or uh, and we don't want to accumulate gradients, right? And now we're going to do the same inference that we had before. And what do you guys think is going to happen? Ah, I forgot that you guys also have uh, the Jupyter notebook there. So like, you know what's happening, right? So like, this is what's happening. Why is that happening? Can anyone explain to me? Yeah, that was because of the optima, uh, of the activation function that, uh, and we had negative values before, so they go to zero and all these values are now zero. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So you see that's like I had a, a, a range here of negative values for this data set that I was working with, right? And they all got projected to zero. And that was exactly because now I'm using a ReLU activation function, which squeezes everything to be in the positive range, right? Which is like from zero to like 200, okay? Any questions about this? Can everyone understand like what's, what was the impact of adding an activation function that doesn't match the actual range or distribution of the values that I'm trying to predict? And why is it important to make sure that I'm matching the two of them? What's the, the range of the values that I'm trying to predict? And what is the activation function that I have at least in the last neuron of my model? In this case, one neuron because it's a perception. Is that clear for everyone? Yeah, let me see what time is it. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So, okay. So now let me see what comes next. Okay. Yeah. So now we're going to see the impact of like normalizing the data as well, because like uh, we have been using the data in its original range, right? So, like the range of the features of the data. We're ranging from minus two to two, right? And the range of the output was minus 200 to 200, right? So let's normalize everything now. So like, which is a step that I'm telling you guys that helps a lot, but I haven't showed it, like actually doing anything, right? So we are gonna use the mean max scalar, which is a function that we use also for SVM. Do you guys remember what the default mean max scalar does for us? So the mean max scalar is going to get each one of these features uh, and the data because I, I have combined the two of them, right? Uh, and it's going to project them to, this, to a specific range that I like, right? So like the default is going to project the uh, range of the features and the uh, ground truth value to be between zero and one. And that's exactly what you're observing here. So like all the values are between zero and one now, including the uh, output, the y, right? Note that the distribution per se is the same, right? So like keep this pattern in mind. And if I come up here now, it's exactly the same pattern. The only thing that has changed is the range, right? So like the distribution is kept, which is extremely important, right? The only thing that has changed is the range, right? 
which means that's like it's a simple linear transformation that I can just undo and bring it back to the original ranges if I wanted, right? If I want to be running this model like without doing this uh, normalization, I could if I wanted. Very well. So like we're gonna do the separation of the training samples and the test samples as we has done before, as we have done before, right? We are gonna set once again the model to be using input equal to true because that hasn't changed. We still have like two features associated to this data, right? We uh, still have just one new one uh, neurons output, right? So like we only have like one value that's gonna be outputted, and we are gonna be using the ReLU once again. Okay. So now we are gonna train this model. Okay. Uh, we are going to be uh, doing exactly the same steps that we did before. So like not nothing new here. This is the uh, loss curve. So you see that like it doesn't simply plateau, but actually it's, it still has like some incremental improvements throughout the process, right? Which is like excellent. According to this curve, I would say that you could train even for a little longer, right? Now we are going to change this model to evaluation mode. So we don't want to keep gradients. We don't want to do any type of regularization. We are just running evaluation, right? Same things that we did before, get model output. Then here we compute the statistics, right? And then we finally plot and then boom, our value equal to one, right? Like this is like a perfect prediction. So you remember that the model before the normalization was perf performing quite well, right? It was 0 0.98. So like, it was not bad at all, right? But the normalization really changed completely this paradigm. Like our value is equal to one. So like there was an improvement here. One more thing. Now in this model, I'm using activation function equal to true, which means that I am using a ReLU this time, right? Why I didn't have this effect now? What changed? Why am I? Why here using ReLU was bad, and here using ReLU is not bad? Is it because of the transformation? Because of the normalization, mm -hmm. right? Because now my output is also between zero and one, right? So it's always positive. So, like, so it's always positive. Okay. So like, it, it, it's in the correct range now. Any questions about that? Could I have used a different type of uh, activation function? Could I have used hyperbolic tangent? What do you guys think? Yeah, I think it will work. Then the output of my model would be between minus one and one, correct? And the ground truth the value is going to be between zero and one. So I would have to let it like for the model to figure out that I don't want negative values, but like the model would be capable of outputting negative values. Would it like work? It could work. Would that be opt optimal? No, because no. like I, I'm I'm setting myself like to 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 failure there, right? I'm allowing my model to be predicting a range that doesn't matter. Okay. What about sigmoid? What do you guys think? I think it would still work, right? Because the weights, the model is maybe flexible enough. Also, it's between sigmoid, zero and one. Yeah, and it's between zero and one. So sigmoid most likely would give us also like an extremely good performance, like our value very close one. Excellent. Yeah. So here we have like a quick test using the tree high data set, but like a downsampled version of it. So you see that like here I'm just using X, Y, and what was the estimate of the tree height? right so and we are just going to use this version just for an example and then we're going to run it like in the full data set right so like we're going to run the mean max scalar so like we're going to normalize these values the, the x y and the height should be like all between zero and one which is what you obtain here right keep in mind that this is a smaller data set Right, so uh, not small data sets, uh, data set that's incomplete in the sense that we only have like coordinates and then the tree height, which by no means it's all the information that we need to estimate the tree height. Right, we're going to do the split of this data set, right, 
So now we are uh, doing a split of 30% of the samples for test, which is like essentially what you observe here. Initially, this data set had about 60,000 samples, I think. Yeah, 66,000. So like about, uh, roughly 46,000 are gonna be used for training, 20% uh, 20,000 to use for tests, okay? Uh, the criterion, it's a sewer regression. So like I'm still gonna use just the uh, mean square error, right? The perception, because I'm using just two features, just the coordinates X and Y, right? Of that tree, the input size is still two, right? And the output size is still one because I'm predicting just the tree height. Okay, with respect to optimizer, I'm not doing anything new. So like that's the still the stochastic gradient with exactly the same learning rates that we were using before. Okay, so now we're gonna train the model again. The structure is exactly the same that we saw before, right? So like no need to once again. I just increased the number of epochs from one thousand to two thousand. Let's train this model. The training curve actually looks pretty decent. Like like. Okay, we have this nice drop here, right? What was the activation function that you're using here? Oh, there was no activation function. So therefore, this is just a linear regression, right? Okay, let's see how this model is performing. Terrible. Our value of 0 0.047 is doing pretty bad, right? Okay, so let's recap what we have done here. So like I had a value that was normalized right between zero and one right because that's what we did here i'm letting my model use the full spectrum of the uh, linear component so like it could be mapping things between minus infinite and infinite right okay this prediction here it's in a actually i i, I wasn't like uh capping to be in a specific range but like the prediction is somehow very narrow, right? It's just going from 0 0.24 to 0 0.32, right? Which happens like when I'm not using activation function either. Like it's not because I'm not bounding, right? That I'm gonna get minus 1,000 to 1,000. But the bounding process, the saturation, this inclusion of no linearity also helps us use the full spectrum of the data, right? So like we, we would be enforcing the mode output to be in, within the range of my activation function. So there is this extra benefit of using activation functions there, right? And besides that, right, we have to keep in mind that just the X and Y coordinates, uh, they are not every, all the information that we need to make a good prediction of the tree height, right? So like the perception did not do the job for us, right? One more piece of information from the experiments that we have done in the support spectrum machine. Now we know that uh, the tree height data set uh, benefited from a no linear uh, transformation, right? Through using a kernel. You guys remember what was the default kernel of SVM? Was it linear? No. What uh... water? Sorry. Yeah. So, like the kernel of the SVM was not linear, it was RBF, right? Which is a quadratic operation. So, like, that implies to us that, like, uh, the tree height regression problem is not a linear problem. So uh, actually you have to take in consideration that as well. So like there is no much hope for using a linear regression here to predict accurate uh, in accurate fashion, the tree heights, right? So we need to scale this problem like to be more complicated, right? So like we need to something more robust than the perception. Luckily we have that in our arsenal. So like we're gonna be discussing that in a little bit, okay? So now let's say let's see what happens. Let me make sure if that's the one that I want to see. Okay, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip that. But those are the experiments in, in which we are using the full uh, data set, right? So like now you see that we are using all the uh, 23 features that we have in the data. Okay, so like you're gonna, and if you run this notebook, which I'm not gonna go over with you guys, but you see that the operations are exactly the same, right? So this notebook is gonna do the perceptual implementation for the uh, tree height data set, 
what's going to change here? So let's see here. Is that here? Now I'm going to give you more options of like uh, no linear activations, right? So for example, we have been using the ReLU, right? So like this one you guys are familiarized with. And this is the way how you call the sigmoid. So like you see that is simple like this. So like torch NN is going to point you towards like all the options for uh, uh, activation functions. And from there, you can see like that there are several others that we haven't discussed, right? But those are the three main ones that like I'd like you guys to play with, right? So if we specify use activation function as being one of those guys here, sigmoid, hyperbolic tangents, or relu, then it's going to build for you a perception that use this uh, respective activation function, okay? And I just noticed that in this experiment, I'm not using the full data set either. I was just using the X and Y coordinates. So like really there is no point in go, going over this one. But if you if I wanted to expand this perception implementation, right? To use all the 23 features instead of using just the first two features, what would I have to change in the way how I'm defining the perception? Anyone? The input size, the very least. The input, the input size should be 23, right? Do I have to change the output size? No, it's still just height, a scaler. Is this still, is still just like one real number, right? Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Then you're going to see like all the experiments that I have done here, and you're going to see that the predictions are still bad, right? So like you see that our value is 0 0.02 and so on, right? Then we get to like using uh, actually feed for networks, which are going to Finally, get started with that now. Okay. Okay. Excellent. We made it. Uh, any questions so far? Any questions with respect to the implementation of the perception? Is the perception sort of clear to everyone? May I ask? 20 minutes. Uh, yeah, please. Yes, this is a like a single perception. This is a this is a, the above is still a single perception. So would uh are we expecting to have a, um since this is only like the only difference between the linear regression uh with mm -hmm. the single perception is an activation function? Uh, are we thinking mm -hmm. um would, would we expect to see a, a huge increase in the uh, in the accuracy, if like for example, all our features, the numbers are already positive, and then so the activation function is just to cut off the negative values, right? So the accuracy uh, might be this similar as uh, using the linear regression. So there are two things that we discuss that the activation does for us, right? The activation function uh, imposes boundaries about with respect to where these values, they should be predicted, right? So like, let's say that uh, for this data set specifically, there is no reason to be predicting negative values, right? So like, there is no reason to use, uh, to not use an activation function because then we make sure that we're like restricted to that specific range, right? Another thing that you have seen as well is that by just let the model make a prediction without an activation function, this prediction might not necessarily be in the range of minus infinite to infinite, but it can also be very constrained, right? In this case, for example, after the normalization, I had the range of the three heights going from zero to 0 0.8, right? Mm -hmm. But like you see that the model output was still very narrow. It was going just from 0 0.23 uh, to 0 0.35. Right, mm -hmm. the activation function also helps you to make sure that you use the full spectrum of this output of the model. Right, so like it forces it to like okay, without an activation function, I'm ranging from zero to twenty three to zero to thirty three. Right, uh, but like if I have an activation function, I'm forced to use the full spectrum. So like I'm constantly stretching the data to also like try to make use of the full range. Mm -hmm. So the activation function plays both roles. Okay, gotcha. so this one, this example doesn't have. Sorry, I kind of made me. Yeah, 
lost lost lo lo the previous one. This 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 particular um uh this particular graph doesn't uh yeah utilize. So you the, see that's like right. So the activation function by default is equal to none. So that means that uh I have no activation function. This so this was just a simple linear regression. Mm, got you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I have 20 minutes and I really want to go over the feed for neural networks with you guys. So maybe we move on for the sake of time. Then feel free to drop any questions later on. All right, so like finally get to nuclear perceptrons, right? So we have discussed about the perceptron being a, a linear solver if you will, right? So like perception is very good for handling like linear problems, right? I had told you several times about the exclusive or problem, right? But like, I haven't defined that. So let's understand first, like what are the other problems that the perception can handle in this case, right? Are you guys familiarized with logical gates? Do you guys know what the end gate is? If I not, Okay, yeah. So for those who don't, right? Like, so like, uh, end gate essentially stands for like I'm only gonna get uh, one in the output when I have both ones in the input one and input two, right? So like, if you guys can't necessarily picture that in, in mind yet, an uh, end gate is gonna look like this. And here I have input one, and here I have input two. Okay. So the output here is only going to be one when I have one input one and one input two, right? That's the only scenario where I have one, right? If I have the plot, the 2D plot of uh, I1 and I2 against each other, right? I'm only going to have a different label, like a, a label equal to one when I'm in, in the position one, one and zero for everybody else, which is represented by these black dots, okay? For a case like this, we have seen several times, right? Of course, we saw in a different scenario where it's look a little bit more like this. I had like the axes here and I had circles in here, right? And then the perception was try to find what's the hyperplane that separates the two of them in a, no optimal fashion, right? So because all that the perception cares about is the separation of classes, right? So this looks a lot like this with the difference that I only have one point here. Right, so this is the end gate problem. The short, uh, the or gate problem is slightly different, right? Because now I get one whenever I have one in one of the inputs. So like you see that like whenever I have one here, 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 doesn't matter if in I one or I two, I always get the one. So this is the two D representation of that. When I put I one versus I two, now I have the two classes. Here I have the ones and here I have the zero. Okay. So now we have defined what is the end and the or gate problems, right? And they are both considered linear problems because I can separate the ones from zeros using one single hyperplane. Questions about that? If not, now let's define what's the short problem, right? So if I have zero and zero in both inputs i1 and i2, I have a zero for the output, right? Now, if I have a zero in i1 and a one for i2, I have a one. If it's the other way around, if I have a one for i1 and a zero for i2, I also have a one. But if I have one in both uh, inputs, I get a zero. That means that's like, it's an exclusive gate, right? So like I only get a one when, only one of the inputs is equal to one. Is that clear for everyone? Okay. So if I represent this in this 2D space where I put I1 versus I2, that's what we observe, right? So like zero, zero is equal to zero, one, one is equal to zero, and I have one, zero, and zero, one in the middle. Okay. Now, I hope you can appreciate at this point that there is no single hyperplane that I can use to separate ones from zeros. Correct? Can everyone see this? Okay. Yep. So what do I do now? Any questions? Any, any ideas of what could be done in this case? 
how can I manage to build a model that can separate this these two? But to use two different perceptrons together. I can use two different perceptrons. In fact, yeah. So let's visualize how that would work, right? So like, okay, for the sake of making this visualization a little bit more clear, right? So this is still a 2D problem. So you can see that down here, I have the points, right? That were organized in a grid. So this is the 2D visualization. This is the 3D visualization. But you see that the problem per se is still lays in this plane, okay? What I'm representing here in gray, this guy here, this is the position of the hyperplane that we're trying to approximate. And this is the output of one perception using sigmoid. Can you guys appreciate the sort of like S shape that you're obtaining here for this line that's going from like uh, purple to yellow? So you see that there is a sort of S shape. That's the classic uh, activation function sigmoid, right? Which is bounded between zero and one. Okay, so Z here is representing the output of the perceptron. Good? All right. So I could have one perception doing this one task here, separating these red points from the blue points, right? And that's what one perception would be able to do for us. Now, if I include more perceptions, right? Now I can have one perception that separates these guys. So this point is red. I think you guys cannot see, but this point is red. Okay, which is more clear here in this other representation. Okay, just to, to clarify what's the problem. So now I have one perception that's separating these one red point from everything else, which includes these other red points, right? So I have this one uh, uh, neuron doing this job, right? This one perception. And I have a second perception that's separating this second uh, red point, right? If I combine the two of them, what I get is this uh, more complex hyperplane now. So this is my hyperplane now. Okay, so that is the stacking of two perceptions together, right? Which now goes from this. So that was the one perception that we have been seeing like often, right? To a stack of perceptions that looks like this. So like now I have this perception this is one perception here, and I have a second perception here, right? Both of them, the prediction of both of them are combined. So that's what we are doing here in this hidden layer to approximate the Y value. Okay? Now, this is the input layer. This is the layer that which we have been using for a long time. But now we have one element that's new to us, right? Which is this intermediary layer here. And it has a name that I have said a couple of times by now, which is the hidden layer. Okay. Now I have one layer that's separating the input from the output, and therefore is the hidden layer. Good. Clear for everyone? And you see that's like by uh, making the problem more complicated, right? Uh, increasing the complex of my model by stacking perceptions now. Now I can finally resolve problems that so far, none of the methods that we have discussed, SVM, perception, linear regression could solve, which is like a more complicated classification task. Good. Any questions? No questions? So there is this one very cool uh, tool that I found out about recently on Twitter, right? Where you can simulate the, uh, let me open your faces again so I can see if anyone has a question there. Yeah. So we can simulate what would happen, right? If we had, uh, for a given set of features, if we had like few neurons, in the input and uh, like how many layers we would like to have, right? So let's replicate first the 
exclusive or problem. So you see that's like, I have a cloud of orange points here, a cloud of orange points here, cloud of blue and blue, right? Let's say that we have zero for hidden layer, right? And now we have two features and zero hidden layers, very well. The activation function, we can put whatever we want. Let's set that to be linear initially, right? And this is a classification. So let's let this model iterate now for a couple of epochs. This is a classification sigmoid. Perhaps that's nice. Right. So you see that there is no actual way for this model to be able to separate the orange from the blues, right? It doesn't matter like if I change the activation function. There is no way for like one single perception to be able to separate the two of them, right? Now let's see what happens when I add one hidden layer. So like now we have exactly the same setup that we had before, right? So like I have one perception here, right? And I have a second perception here. Okay, so let's let's let this thing iterate. And boom, now we have like these two hyperplans that basically replicates what we're seeing here. Uh, here, right? But like now we are seeing that from the top. That's the only difference. Okay, would anything change if we had three neurons in the hidden layer? Let's see. No, because I only need two, right? Let's see. It's still converse, right? Because like, in fact, I only need two neurons in the hidden layer. I only need two hyperplans to do the separation. Okay? Very good. Any questions with respect to that? Like, I definitely suggest you guys to play with this. So you can see like, what's the difference like with different activation functions? Oh, Relu broke it. Very interesting. Why would the Relu break it? Mm. That sounds like a cool question for an assignment. <laughs> very cool, very cool. I love this tool. Okay, that was just for illustrate. So let's not get too carried away. So let me describe to you guys now some of the other intricacies with respect to how we train these models now, right? Because now we know very well how to train linear regression, SVMs, and how to train also the perceptron now. But now we need to start stacking these perceptrons, right? So things get complicated now because now I no longer have before I could just compare how the weights, the loss was changing with respect to the weights that I had linking the input features all the way to the output, right? So that was a very simple case to solve. But now that I have like all these hidden layers, right? All these hidden neurons, I no longer have this direct connection because I also have to fine tune these guys here, right? So the, now this becomes a little bit more complicated. So let's try to understand first how this takes place, right? So like we can formulate the problem properly, right? So now we're trying to find how we are gonna compute the output in this very last neuron here, like the output layer, right? So we are we having just one neuron here on the output, therefore all we can get uh, here would be either zero and one or like one uh, real number in the case of a regression, right? Okay. So here is still the uh, input layer. So we have like the features of the data, x1, x2, all the way to xn, right? Uh, A, in this case, right, is going to correspond to the output of like any given neuron, right? Like either, either way, like in the hidden layers, right? Or like, uh, the, because now I have two hidden layers. We have the first hidden layer and the second hidden layer. A is going to represent the output of any given neuron. So like now we're gonna to refer to the perceptions that we have been discussing so far as, as a neuron that is part of this network, okay? The output of that neuron, right, is gonna be summed with the respective weights 
right? So for example, if I'm computing, what's the input that's coming to this neural, right? I have the A that's coming from this hidden layer. So each one of them have an A, right? So like A1, A2, A3, and A4 is gonna be multiplied by the weights. So I have the weights here, W1, W2, W3, and W4 and so on, right? And I have a bias that's also added to each one of them, right? So like I have a bias V1 here for example, and this one will have a bias B2, okay? So in this case, I have this bias B1, I have this summation of A going from one all the way to four, right? And I have these weights, these four weights that are associated to this neuron, for example. The output of this neuron now is this uh, operation, right? Which would be like the uh, summation of all the weights, uh, all the activations that are coming from this layer, right? So summed with the respective weights that we have, add the bias or not, depending if you're setting a bias. And then you pass this output through an activation function. So like, remember that now we have this F function here, which here is rep represented by the Sigma symbol. And that is this I uh, prime. So that is the fact of what goes to be summed like in the output layer. Okay, so that's how the forward propagation works. So that's how we combine information that's coming from the input all the way to the output, right? It's by performing this operation for each one of the perceptrons or each one of the neurons that compose this network. Okay, very well. Now I'm going to spare you from the details of how the back propagation is computed, but essentially what we're doing is this is this CO2. Uh, compare the output of my model, oh, AL, right? Remember that now what we have is no longer just the summation as you had before, right? Remember that before what we were doing is to compare Y to the product Y uh, T X, right? But now X is completely detached from the uh, output of the model, which was before just W terms X, right? Because now we have hidden layers. Okay, so now we describe that in terms of activations, right? So the activations, as we described before, for any given neuron is the sum, uh, weighted sum by Ws, right? Of the output of the, pre the neurons on the previous layer, right? And after an activation function. So that's essentially what this operation is doing for us here, okay? But because we don't have this direct link between the output and the input. We have to account for how each one of these neurons, they are uh, contributing towards the difference between the output of the output layer, which is the IL here, and the desired output. That's where things become more complicated because now I need to account for these contributions individually in each one of these neurons and accumulate gradients, uh, the gradients such that I can optimize all these weights simultaneously, right? I'm not going to spend too much details to the map here because like, I don't want us to lose these pressures of oh, five minutes. Oh man. Uh, but that's essentially what back propagation does, okay? And uh, I'm going to, I already pointed towards that, like in the chapter where they describe that, like in the uh, Young Good Fellow book, right? about deep learning, so you can get more details there if you want. So let's talk about optimizers in these last five minutes that we have, okay? So we have discussed uh, uh, thoroughly already, like the stochastic gradient, right? So we discussed what's the impact of like uh, the learning rate, right? So the learning rate is this scalar that we use to say by how much you would like to consider the gradients in which we're going to be taking the step towards, right? So if I get a small learning rate, that means that I'm taking smaller steps. If I get a bigger learning rate, I multiply the, the gradients by a, a greater number, therefore I take bigger steps, right? Very well. So like these we have been discussed uh, quite a bit. So what happens, right? Like if you're visualizing that in, in this scenario here, is that, for example, if I'm taking uh, just like few samples, right? I might be tempted during the process of optimizing 
uh, the uh, weights to get stuck in, in somewhere around here, right? Because this corresponds to the place where I have the uh, derivative of the loss or the error in this case, I'm using error, right? With respect to the weights, at least with respect to weight one to be equal to zero, then I can get stuck in this place, right? Where here the derivative is also equal to zero, right? So like now I hope you can appreciate that is just using this metric no longer helps me, right? That's why stochastic gradient per se is not that used, right? Because like I'm in uh, I increase the likelihood of events like this happening, right? Are there things that can uh, let me use the stochastic gradient still? Yes, right? So for example, we have been talking about batching, for example. So like I do this optimization over different samples, right? So for example, if I have one single sample uh, mini batch, right? So let's say that's like I had 1,000 uh, samples in this data set. If I do this, the first optimization with just the first 100, I might have an error that looks like that, right? So I could potentially get stuck according to this first 100 samples. If I keep doing that over like the next 100 and then the next 100, this loss landscape might change slightly, right? And because I'm doing these optimization steps for each one of these little chunks of the data, the overall might still point me like, okay, so according to the previous uh, mini batch, that's how the loss landscape was looking like. But according to the next mini batch, the loss landscape changed slightly, right? So like you see these uh, dashed gray lines here. So that corresponds to like what are all the possible uh, shapes of loss landscape that are determined by specific chunks of the data, right? So like stochastic gradients, not entirely trash. That's what I'm saying. So like if you combine that with mini batching, you can still uh, find like a pretty good way of like uh, optimizing your algorithms. Okay. 145. Let me just see. How far I am. Yeah, so now you're going to start talking about the more the more interesting optimizers. Okay, so I'm I'm going to stop here. Uh, yeah, I'm going to stop here, and then like from in the beginning of the next class, I start from optimizers, right? Right after optimizers, we start. Uh, doing the uh, neuronal net the feed for neuronal networks tutorial. Yeah, I'm gonna do that then. Okay, any questions so far? So again, what's the take home message here, right? So like we have seen that the perception it has its limitations. Like the perception is just like uh, no linear regressor that's like use all the components of the linear regression right and then as a no linearity to, it to make the training process easier right but like in the end of the day it's just like a more robust linear regressor right then we saw when things don't work right so for example if i have a more complicated data set like something that's no linear the perception cannot handle that. Perceptions can only handle linear cases, right? And then now we have seen an alternative to work around that, which is basically to increase the capacity of the, the model by uh, it starts stacking these units, these single perceptions into a network. These perceptions, we have seen that they have similar components to a neuron. That's why people refer to it as a neuron, although it has like, it's still like significant difference to it, right? When you in include the neurons in a network, we have a neuronal network that now is capable of solving more complicated uh, problems, like as we have seen with the XOR problem. And there is quite a bit of theoretical work that says that these neuronal networks, they can pretty much approximate any type of function that you want, right? As long as you're willing to keep increasing the capacity, which means that you need like bigger computers to train those models, okay? And now we're gonna talk about in more details, what are the techniques that are people that people are using nowadays to train those things, which like the optimizer section, and then we are gonna do the tutorial on it. Okay, so that's the plan for the next class. Uh, any questions so far? Mm, I have kind of a general question because when we mm -hmm. 
when we train with machine learning models, you showed some output how well the yeah how, how the training data compares to the let's say a, a, a data that was not um, trained on. But if you have mm -hmm. like kind of several variables, how would you like compare the importance of certain variables or like uh, how well they predict uh, a response? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, that's a great question. So like in contrast to the random forest, which you have like an importance per feature, right? What they have described so far doesn't give you like a degree of interpretability about the importance of the variables, right? Yeah. But there is one thing that hopefully I get to discuss in more details, which is called uh, salience analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so sal salience analysis basically says like, okay, Assuming that, for example, I'm training a model that does a classification, right? Let's say that in the end of this network, I classify this as being like an image of ocean. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. assuming that you classify this as being one specific class, people have found out that if you backpropagate this class through this network, it's going to light up some specific features that are the ones that matter the most for this specific label. And that you can use as a way to inspect which features they matter the most for you when you you have one specific label. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Is this then? So I, I've seen pictures of um, convolutional neural networks that look at images, and then they produce these heat maps to say these areas yeah. lit up for is that saliency analysis then? That this, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's called salience analysis. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. why I was saying that uh, probably I'm going to get to that once we start talking about say, uh, convolutional neural networks, because that's where these things they are most used. Yeah. And then I Did have you one have question. a question, Joe? E yeah. I, mine's on kernels, so that's not necessarily what we talked about today. So if anyone else has a question, maybe go first. Well, I guess you can just go. Yeah. Yeah. So is the so in the kernel method where we just talked, or you told me we're just adding uh, additional dimensions. Just from my intuition, is it equivalent to then just so in the in the linear regression world would be to add squared terms, quadratic uh, uh, cubic terms, or interactions? Is that essentially what we're doing? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's okay. essentially what the kernel trick is, right? Cool. So, for example. Cool. Let's say that the features of the data, they are uh, X and Y, right? And that's not, not enough for you to be able to separate this data set, right? So what you do next is to include one more feature that like, let's say is the product of X and Y. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then yeah. it still didn't work. So like now you're going to include the product of X plus Y. It still did, well, did it work. So now you're going to do X square plus Y square. You know, so yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. what the kernel trick does for you, right? So like cool. you see that we went from a 2D problem to now a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5D problem, right? So that's yeah. already in 5D. Cool, that's cool, what cool. the kernel although, trick does. Although plus shouldn't do anything, but yes. Uh, um, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. If the, the trick that's used by the kernel is going to be used for or not, that's another question, but the, the, that's essentially what kernel tricks stands for. <clears throat> Ask okay. Uh, is, there, is there cases that uh, the multi neural networks like uh, is there cases like uh, like a, there will be like an optimum number of layers like maybe and if you increase the mm -hmm. layers then it might even reach a lower accuracy or like maybe in some cases that one mm -hmm. layer is the best and two layers not not the best is is that possible or yeah so the hidden layer so there, there is theoretical working on that right there are several mathematicians that work in machine learning nowadays because you can see that these very quickly scales to be like an interesting mathematical problem right but the the notion so far is that increasing the number of hidden layers that you have increase the dimensionality of the problem that you're working with Right, so that would be almost equivalent to the kernel trick that you have described for the SVM. You see, so like by you, and you remember that you said that like the kernel trick is useful when you're handling a problem that's not separable or like that you can easily deal with in the original domain. But if you increase the complexity of the problem, the dimensionality of the problem, 
you increase the likelihood that you're going to find a, a space where you can separate two classes, for example. So that's essentially what increasing the number of hidden layers does for you. Okay. Uh -huh. But you see that like not all the kernel tricks, they're actually useful. So like it, it increases your chance of finding a better space to work with, but it doesn't mean that necessarily it's going to help you because mm -hmm. you can have like 1000 layers and just make the problem of training the, the, the model more complicated, right? As you can see, like as you keep in, by just adding one hidden layer, all this stuff already came up, right? So like mm -hmm. training these already becomes complicated, right? And is low because more parameters, more things that you need to fine tune simultaneously, right? So like that that's not a given that more neurons or more layers are gonna be better than fewer layers. So in the end of the day, it comes down to like a hyper parameter that needs to be tuned as well. So you will converge, right? Like we'll maybe try different uh, in the future, try different layers, and then maybe after 10 or 15 layers, and it will be the same R R squared. Most likely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and I got basically the same question, but uh, there are other some method like, for example, grid search, which were you you mentioned earlier to look for the optimal mm -hmm. uh, uh, learning rate to search for the optimal value of these other uh, hyperparameters, like the number of hidden layers and the number of uh, neurons in each of these layers, uh, like maybe some formal methods to 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 choose for this. Right, yeah. I mean, you can use such techniques, right? Which is like, I'm going to do a grid search or like I'm going to use a platform like weights and bias that I mentioned before to say what's the complex of the model that I need to solve this task. And that's the thing that I do myself, right? Like what's the number of neurons per layer and how many layers, like different types of activation functions, sometimes even the loss, like I don't know if I should be using mean square error, mean absolute error, or if I should be using entropy, right? So it's a loss that we haven't discussed so far because that's mean for classification, but like that's good. Those are all things that usually I play with, right? Like I just try to understand my data as the best as I can to narrow the set of possibilities to like a very concise set of possibilities. So I don't have to browse over like the whole space, right? But in the end of the day, it comes down to experimentation, for sure. Either like experimentation through a grid search or something different, like uh, Bayesian search or uh, some random combination, right? But yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah that, to do search. Yeah, so and in the case, for example, you know, in the case of regression, you you, you mentioned all as a methods like regularizations which are aimed at the uh, at making the model more simple maybe or more, or more, more parsimonious and in case of neural networks maybe uh, others the same maybe uh, approach to look for the the simplest possible like uh, architecture which gives uh, like uh, uh, satisfactory results at, uh, to, to penalize for the this number of hidden layers or this complexity of these networks um, like this yeah, no, th there was quite a bit of work, which funny enough was done by Jeff Hinton. I don't know if you guys have heard of him recently. He's the guy who has been called the godfather of AI, and he just quit uh, Google recently because he wanted to say that we need to put guardrails for chat GPT, right, and models like this. But he was doing really cool research towards that. So, like, instead of optimizing just the weights, right, it was optimizing the network by itself, like during training, right? So he designed this uh, new algorithm that was dropping connections, right? So like during the training, you disappear with like these neurons, I would just kill them, right? And then I would kill these other ones here, which it's a thing that like uh, for a specific neurons, there is already one regularization technique that's called dropout. And I'm going to discuss that like in a little bit uh not this class of course because we are way over time but like this you eliminate the connections to one specific near once at a time but what he was doing was to drop like whole layers right so like i always keep connection to the next layer or drop dropping like few neurons that work together right and in this process he would converge also to what's the most optimal architecture 
right? So that was one of the things that he was optimizing. But funny enough, he didn't catch up. Like he didn't really manage to make that a popular thing. Okay. Yeah, Guys, unfortunately, okay. I really need yeah, to go. Great. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we keep talking the next yeah. lecture. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, feel free to, to close. Yeah. Um, so I suggest for all of you guys to to rewatch the the Antonio's lecture and also rerun the Jupyter notebook and try to make links between you know the PowerPoint presentation or each single function in uh, optimization in the skill scale and PyTorch uh, library. In this way you. You, you create a link between the theory and the practical coding and so on. So this is what I, I, I often do it in this case. <laughs> and uh, we are going to, to meet again in two I'm, I'm going to run. Okay, so okay I will talk post to you guys. As usual, later. the lecture in a couple of hours.